But there has been some uh, questions raised about uh, manufacturability of this technology, uh, in particular along with, uh, say, established technology like uh, CMOS. Uh, so, what is your perspective on uh, manufacturability of this technology? And is this equation direct to me? Yes. Okay. So, so the question from from uh, Professor uh, and Chancellor Kong is, uh, what is my view of the manufacturability and integrability of memristors uh, with CMOS. And in fact, uh, we think that, uh, uh, that, that, it, that it's excellent uh, uh, for three major reasons. One is that the materials that, that at least we and many other people are using, uh, these oxide materials, are uh, already in many fabs around the world. And so there's not the, uh, the, the, the trauma of trying to introduce a new material and worrying about uh, it contaminating uh, regular CMOS processes. Uh, so, so that's uh, uh, one uh, Im important issue. The second issue is that the structures for the memristors or the memristor components of an integrated circuit are relatively simple. Uh, they're, they're straightforward uh, crossbar type structures. Uh, that means that, that geometrically they're simple. They should be relatively inexpensive to fabricate. And uh, they are, uh, uh, because of their ge geometrical regularity, uh, there's something that uh, 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 lithographically is reasonably uh, easy to, to, to lay out uh, and to manufacture. Uh, and then the third issue is uh, we're, we're pretty confident that we can integrate... Uh, uh, memristors and CMOS because we've already done it. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, I, I sort of was going slow in my talk, so I didn't get to, to, to that particular view graph. But we have actually built a chip uh, uh, in my laboratory in which we integrated uh, 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 memristor crossbars on top of uh, foundry CMOS, and we built a, a chip which was... Uh, uh, inspired by the work that uh, Dmitry Strukov and his then advisor uh, Kostya Likarev did uh, to, to look at uh, using memristors as the uh, configuration bit and routing element uh, in, in a, a field programmable gate array uh, chip. And so we built a, essentially a toy uh, a FPGA uh, using memristors integrated on CMOS. But the issue was that there was no problem in terms of of either the, the uh, uh, ability to uh, mix memristors into or onto a, a foundry CMOS chip. So we worked out all of the details about how to do that. And, and the one issue that we really had to solve was that the, that the usual CM, uh, uh, CMP processes for, for uh, uh, polishing or planarizing uh, CMOS chips actually isn't good enough, and so we had to we had to improve the planarization process to be able to put uh, uh, memristors on top of that. But uh, once that problem was solved, it was fairly straightforward. So there's, there there was no disruption of the underlying CMOS by by putting the the memristors on top. And then the other issue is that that all the voltages were compatible, and and in fact, uh, you know, the, the the chip worked as uh, uh, as it had, was designed to work. I mean, we, we were able to switch the devices using uh, the, the, the CMOS. Now, admittedly, that this particular CMOS was a little bit higher voltage than most, but, uh, uh, but uh, I don't think that that's, that's really a limitation. So, so the, you know, we have, we have a, a, a proof of principles uh, uh, a demonstration that we've done anyway. We've published a paper. It was actually published in about June of last year. Uh, uh, de de describing the circuit and its operation. So uh, from, from, from those standpoints, I think that, uh, that this is a technology which, uh, you know, in, in our view is ready for development. And, you know, there's a lot of other companies, both startups and major companies out there that are, are pursuing various uh, forms of, of, of this technology. So I think there's quite a bit of confidence out there uh, and probably... Uh, more than one existing chip, uh, uh, you know, besides ours, that just haven't uh, sort of seen the light of day in, of, of publication yet. Thank you. So, next question. 
Can I ask you a question on this? What, what do you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask Stan questions. <laughs> well, I mean, since I could be there, actually. Uh, you know, Stan, uh, you mentioned that the configuration bits you have uh, implemented using, using, using Memristor, but uh, the way I understand is that uh, from <clears throat> truth of stock, that you are also using the Memristor on the signal path, right? Unlike in the FPGA, the configuration bit uh, is basically <coughs> turning on a pass transistor or a transmission gate. So from that point of view, to what extent do you find out that the tolerance of the memristor on resistance, and since the whole bunch of them will be in series, can cause some sort of, you know, timing, delay, and all kinds of problems that this VLSI folks talk about? Okay, so... Effectively, let me let me just repeat. The, well, I guess the, I don't have to repeat the question since you're you're mic'd, okay? But <laughs> yeah. but but let me just to, uh, rephrase a little bit. The, the the issue is that in this toy FPGA chip that we fabricated, the memristors essentially take the place not only of the configuration bit but the routing circuitry. Right. So the the memristor is is effectively in series with the uh, 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 elements uh, of of the device or, or of, of the chip. And, and, you know, the fact is, frankly, we didn't string a very large number of logic gates together, mm -hmm. but at the level of the simple logic functions that we composed, uh, uh, there really wasn't a problem. And in fact, given the, the very high resistances of nanowires anyway, the, the, the lower range of our memristor on, on uh, uh, states didn't really add that much extra resistance into the system just just from the wires already. So so it wasn't a, a, a huge perturbation. I mean, when we turned the, the, the memristors into their off state, it was a quite high resistance, and that effectively did isolate the, the logic gates from each other. But then in the on state, uh, they were able to, to talk to each other. And, and again, this was not a uh, something that we'd go out on the, on the street and sell. Yeah, the, 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 the circuit as a whole was somewhat slow. But it was really, I would say that the exercise was, was meant as much to demonstrate the process compatibility of making the, the, the memristors uh, as anything else. I mean, we, certainly we have a long way to go before we'd have a, a commercial FPGA circuit. But your, your question is very fair. Uh, uh, you know, the, our, our speeds weren't blazing uh, by by, by any, any stretch of the imagination, but uh, you know, uh, for for a first time through, I was somewhat surprised it worked at all. Okay. So from from that standpoint, I was pretty happy. Sure. Yes, we have a question over here. Yes, so, so, so that's, that's a good question. Let me just rephrase it a little bit. Uh, so the question had to do with the, the, the pictures that I was showing on my uh, view graphs, uh, which are sort of the standard device configuration that we publish on anyway, which is a titanium dioxide film with platinum electrodes on either side. Uh, and so the question was, uh, uh, since platinum is not a standard metallization used in, in fabs, uh, uh, you know, are there alternatives? And, and the answer to that is, uh, yes, there are alternatives. Uh, uh, there are, the, the reason that we use platinum in our uh, process has essentially most to do with history than anything else, and also with the fact that we actually use a liftoff procedure to fabricate our wires. <laughs> And because of that, we need a metal that has very, very small grains. Because after, after all, we're making our, our, our metal wires, uh, in some cases, down to uh, uh, less, less than 10 nanometers. And so we need uh, uh, to, 
because we're using liftoff, we need uh, a, a material that that, that uh, uh, crystallizes with, with very, very small grains. Uh, and, and platinum does that very nicely. Other metals uh, uh, tend to have much larger grain size and therefore give uh, much rougher and much uh, uh, less controlled uh, wires uh, for small sizes like that. In a standard fab, uh, where, for instance, people are using the copper damascene process uh, and they have, uh, you know, various uh, uh, procedures for uh, making barrier layers, uh, uh, we, we essentially think that, that there shouldn't be any real problems with using uh, those materials uh, and, and the types of materials that we're using for the memristors. So, so our, our anticipation uh, you know, even based upon some experiments that we've done in-house is that uh, there's nothing magical about platinum. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it works, but then other things work as well. Uh, so we, we just think uh, uh, it, uh, literally we're just going to have to tweak standard uh, uh, fab processes a little bit in, in, in order to make them uh, compatible. But we'll see. Uh, that's, that's, that's something that... Uh, uh, that needs to be done. I will mention one thing, however. One does have to be careful about using metals like aluminum, and that's because aluminum actually reacts very strongly with titanium dioxide. And so if you have a, an aluminum, titanium dioxide, aluminum structure, after a while what you find out is that you wind up with titanium metal and aluminum oxide. And so that's, that, that, that can be a problem uh, uh, over time. So you do want to have a metal or some material that, uh, that is not as reactive toward oxygen as, say, aluminum is. And that's another reason for platinum. But, but, it's, but platinum isn't magical in all of this. It's <coughs> not, I mean, I don't view it as essential. Yeah, can I ask a further question? That, uh, but, uh, you Well, I think that, again, I mean, I mentioned that, that aluminum is, is, is actually not something you'd want to use for other reasons. But uh, some of these, uh, you know, barrier materials that are already used in, uh, in semiconductor processes, the nitrides and whatever, that are used to, to as, as, as uh, barrier layers between copper and, and, and other uh, materials in a, in, a, in a current IC stack are also fairly high work function materials. So I don't, uh, again, I don't, I don't see a, a real huge problem there. I mean, I, I would ask a way to also answer that because a titanium oxide platinum combination is one successful way to make the resistor, and we have demonstrated with uh, silver and amorphous silicon. How much, what is the behavior of the silver in terms of the current density and the electromigration and other effects? Can you, can you answer that way? Um, well, I think the current, basically, you have, just like Stan said, there's a barrier that is a very risky barrier. So you can control the barrier thickness, you can control the current, you can also control. In some cases, it's more like a uniform um, migration. In our case, it's more like a very localized film type of conductor. So if you control the film size and the length, you can control the current. So you can get the current to be very, very low in certain cases, for example, below. On the order of 10 nanometers, for example, in our device. So you can get very, very low current density. Yes, question right here. Yes, go ahead. You're, okay. you're, you're. Yeah, I'm uh, from Korea. Yes. Korea, a uh, whole organization, a uh, university and a research institute uh, published papers on the manister. That is a device related. But they used uh, different materials as uh, some organization used uh, a kind of single layers. Uh, university, another university used another material. 
What's going to be a major <coughs> material being familiar with the sea walls? Okay, so so I think the, the so the question that was asked, uh, or this you know first of all, a statement that was made is that in fact, if you look at at research work that's going on in Korea and, and in many other places as well, people are using a wide variety of different materials to get memristor uh, functionality, and so the question I think is, uh, uh, what is the final material going to be? Uh, and, and, and what is the configuration going to be? And so uh, I will first, uh, you know, just say something myself, and that is uh, I have no idea uh, what the final material is going to be. Titanium dioxide for us turns out to be convenient. It's not necessarily the best. Uh, <clears throat> there are other related materials, and we are studying, shall we say, a wide variety, and we haven't published on any other material yet, and so I won't uh, bother to, to, to say anything about that. But uh, you also heard about uh, silicon and silver. That's another material that people are looking at. I think, I mean, my, my view is that, that, that in the end, what's going to determine the materials that will actually be used is not the best memristor. It's going to be the cheapest one, or the one that's most uh, easily uh, uh, handled or gives people the least amount of fear inside of a fab. And that's, that's part of the reason why we're working with the one the material set that we are. Uh, uh, you know, certain fabs uh, just won't even consider allowing a new element in, in, in their facility at all. And so you just have to look around and see what they've got existing inside and then figure out how to work from, 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 from that material set. And so from that standpoint, I think uh, you know, we're in pretty good shape. But, uh, but there are a huge variety of materials that have this, this, uh, this property. If you think back to the transistor, I mean, the first transistor uh, was, was germanium, but before that they were thinking about using copper sulfide, and there, there was a big argument over germanium and copper sulfide for a long time, and then they wound up settling on silicon. And I think that we're, you know, in, in, in even a more primitive state right now with, with memristors, and, and the problem is that we're both blessed and cursed and that we've got a huge variety of, of materials to select from. So it's not just that there's this very small number of materials, we've got a gigantic number and we somehow have to sift from those and, 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 and use them. So I think it's gonna be the fabs that will determine uh, the final material and, uh, and we'll just make the best possible memristor we can out of that material rather than take the best memristor and, 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 and go from there. So I don't know, Panaki, do you have uh, do uh, you want to comment on this also? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, in a different way, actually, the, uh, you know, especially uh, since uh, originally we funded uh, with the NSF money, and this year also, uh, right now, it's sponsored by NSF. And NSF has, uh, you know, double mission in one side uh, to spur new research, new scientific ideas. On the other side, how you embrace the scientific idea in the education model, actually. So... From that point of view, yes, there is a concern that, you know, I mean, because this device is not like a FET transistor or something like that, that you can sprinkle uh, discreetly at different uh, places for applic uh, in order to augment that ap application. This, is, uh, this works only in array structures, either in the form of um, PLA or FPGA or uh, memory array and all. So to what extent we'll be able to disperse the application of memristors in diversified circuit, uh, you know, circuit applications actually. So that, that is something is quite, uh, I don't know what, how to, I mean, do you, do you believe that we can discreetly process a couple of memristors at various places uh, uh, in a circuit layout? Well, okay, that's, that's a very good question, and in fact, uh, I'm not sure that, that that's ever going to be uh, economically viable. Right. I think that, uh, that uh, where memristors are going to really find significant utilization is where they can be uh, integrated into a system in, in very large numbers, in very high density, as a crossbar, most likely. Yes. Uh, uh, embedded in in the, the the metallization layer, if you will, so you're not taking precious uh, silicon real estate uh, 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 to utilize that. But uh, 
I mean, but I think that you, you, you make a very good point. It's, uh, uh, I, I, I think that, uh, that, that at least for now, uh, given uh, the, the properties that they have, it's very easy to see how they're going to be utilized for memory and storage applications. And I think that those will be huge and those will dominate sure. uh, the discussion of, of, of memristors in the industrial world for a long time. But, uh, but these other applications, uh, the ones that uh, Leon is talking about, uh, the synaptic types of, 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 uh, of, of uses, I mean, there you want to have something like 10 to the 14, 10 to the 16 <coughs> synapses in a system, and, and there I think memristors are the only thing that's right. going to give you that, uh, that high level of integration. So, right. so I think that, uh, that, that memristors may very well start off <coughs> as digital memory and sort of make a leap into uh, analog computation uh, and, 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 and may not propagate into many other things uh, because uh, uh, you want to have uh, uh, large numbers and large densities. So what, what about uh, the SRC perspective? I mean, well, actually, this, um, yeah, I, I agree with <coughs> what you're saying. I think that the final material and the manufacturing process <coughs> is not going to be determined by the issues we've talked about so far. If you're putting 10 to the 14th of these devices down, it's going to be driven by all the defectivity, um, manufacturability issues that just haven't come up yet because you can't do it until you have a lot of those devices with, uh, you know, billions of, of memristors on it and you, and, you, and you realize which process is going to give you the, the cost-effective solution. So I think, and you know, you, <clears throat> for silicon, I mean, the, the reason why uh, silicon was settled on as the material is because it has a great oxide. And, um, you know, that wasn't the focus of the, of, of the development when they were thinking about transistors. And I think memristors are sort of in that, in, in that stage right now. So I, would, I expect to see um, a, an inferior memristor but a more superior manufacturing process probably evolve and be the, the dominant one as years go on. Okay. So there's a question over here, yes. You mentioned RE RAM as a, uh, having a future as a non volatile storage market. And of course, member skirts, member skirts should have a future there too. How do you see the two? Uh, well, actually, um, in the larger category, um, the memristor, uh, the, the structure <coughs> we're talking about is an RE RAM element. Um, so that's, that's the way I, I characterize that. It was part, in, in the ITRS view of memory possibilities, memristor, the tie oxide, ionic movement to, to change the state is part of the, the RE RAMs. Yes. I think Cameron wants to say something. Yeah, I just the, have a question to the panel itself and maybe the audience. Oh, wait a minute. Before we get the, there's a couple more questions out here. So and, and if, if things get slow out here, we'll start start seating them from up here. Okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, but, so. but but can I comment on Steve's uh, question? Yeah. Uh, Steve, I, I I tend to disagree in the sense that uh, you're saying the memristor is uh, included as a subset of our ROM. And I'm saying it's the other way around. Our ROM is a subset of memristor, <laughs> <laughs> and and in fact. Uh, <laughs> In fact, there is a conceptual, uh, I think, terminology. I, I hope that we can all agree. And the, remember, memristor is, is simply defined as a two-terminal device, and where you are using the resistance as the memory. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and as long as you are using a resistor as a memory, by definition, it's a memristor. That, that's that's the correct definition because how you affect that, what's the dynamic that give you that, is our details. Mm -hmm. Any any two terminal device that you use as a memory, when when, when you look at the resistance change, is a memory. So that's the definition. And so if you agree on that definition, then our one and source faces are they all memory source in my yeah. How in can my I book. argue with you? <laughs> <laughs> so I said I, I agree. With you. You with the definition. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I don't. I don't think it's important to to agree on a definition. But yeah. but it's, it's conceptual issue here. You know, what is, what is, first of all, when we talk about resistance change, you should ask, what, what do you mean by resistance? Well, it, the resistance is only defined when you say, talk about Ohm's law, because how else are you going to define, and it's defined to be linear, mm -hmm. otherwise what's resistance? 
So immediately when you say it's resistance, you're talking about Ohm's law. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the Ohm's law though is not constant. Uh, that's, and, and as soon as the Ohm's law is the resistance is not constant, by definition it's a membrane resistance. Yeah. And it's just, the, it's just up to the, 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 the person doing that to find out what is the model that will best good replicated behavior, but it's a memory store. I agree with you 100%, because okay. what you're yeah. really saying yeah. is that every one of these RE RAMs is a variable resistor, Absolutely. and that's a memory yeah. store. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It's got to have two terminals, mm -hmm. okay? Two terminals, and the resistance changes just by virtue of the current of water passing through it. That, that by definition, is memory store, okay? And, then, and it, it, the, the other is just to find the right model that will, that will mimic it properly, uh, so, so in that sense, phase change memory, RAM, because they all depend on resistance change. Mm -hmm. They are memory store by definition. The only thing is that what I find very intriguing is that 1969, 1971, 1973, a physicist, a circuit theorist, and a biologist thought about the same element together. Yeah. So did you go to school together? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Janice? Well, the way we uh, actually model the, um, the energy function of the system, which we are targeting to uh, solve this, uh, you know, defect uh, reconfiguration problem, that requires that the interactions between the uh, row neuron and column neuron in different ways. In, so in each quadrant, they represent that, actually. So, the algebra you're doing right. In, in, okay. in, in these two, there is no, uh, the, there is synapse that the transistor that you are seeing is synapse, but that synapse is a fixed synapse actually. The other one is variable depending on the fault, and that's what you're programming with, with the help of memristor. One of my concerns on the uh, resistor is the availability of the uh, main resistive uh, devices. Uh, especially the main reason. Uh, do the, does the uh, HP company have the commercialized plan on mass production of the discrete main research devices? <coughs> okay, so let me, let me uh, uh, this is I think uh, two questions here. So there is uh, a concern about reproducibility of, of memristors, uh, one issue. And another is, uh, does HP plan on commercializing devices around memristors? So the answer to the first question essentially is that, uh, uh, you know, in the early days in our lab, and I'm sure in, in everybody's lab, uh, yeah, there was a lot of variability in, in the memristors. Uh, in our more recent devices, uh, if we make a, 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 a bunch of devices in a very small area on a wafer, and our ability to manufacture is actually pretty crude still. We don't have a, we don't have a, a, a fab, we have a lab. So in, in, but in lab fabricated devices, when, when they're within a, a small neighborhood of each other, the devices are, their electrical characteristics are pretty much indistinguishable. Uh, uh, however, there is some variation, uh, you know, even from sweep to sweep, and this again comes about because of the same problem that everybody is having with very small devices, and that is uh, stochastic issues. I mean, uh, transistors are not immune to this because of the fluctuations of the number of dopants uh, uh, in, a, in a channel uh, when, when, when you get very small. So, th so this, is, this is not a special problem of memristors. This is a problem of nanoelectronic circuits and, and every device at the nanoscale has this problem. So uh, uh, there are issues then that one has to deal with when your thresholds and, and other things start to fluctuate 
And so that's a, that's, that's a challenge to the entire community, uh, not just to memristors. I don't see, I mean, the fact that we are seeing some of these, vari these, these vari uh, variations in our devices is, is not because it's a memristor, it's because it's small. Uh, and because we're making very small memristors, we, we tend to get some, some, some fairly significant uh, variations. So that's, uh, that, that's, a, that's, that's just a, a, a problem that the entire community has to deal with and is dealing with. Uh, in, in, in various ways. Uh, it's one of the reasons why clock speeds uh, in real circuits aren't up to the level of the ITRS. Yeah. Not the only reason, but one of them. Uh, just because of variations in, 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 in uh, transistor characteristics don't allow you to run the clock uh, at, 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 a, at a speed that's appropriate for the average. Uh, now, uh, the second question is, does HP plan on commercializing um, memristors, and the answer to that question is yes. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, right here. Hi, thanks for very much from Imperial College. Uh, I'd like to address a question to Professor Sua. Uh, do you think that uh, is the discovery of the memristor enough to emulate uh, neural networks? So let me let me just go ahead and, and, and repeat that question yes, because just... for the for the uh, right. uh, for the the microphone. And so the question was, is the discovery of the memristor enough for the uh, ability to, to manufacture neural networks? Okay, my, my, my answer is that it's probably uh, uh, the timing is just about right when we, we, we to, to make anything uh, that's not a toy in, in when we go near, in, you need a very large number of synapses. And as already pointed out with, uh, by Stan and other people, the, the, the current uh, electronics uh, technology is such that the size of uh, a synapse uh, takes about almost about the same area as the size of a neuron. And yet we have uh, at least 10,000 or 20,000 more per neuron. And that's why it's impractical to make any uh, neuromorphic circuits uh, uh, till now, except when they are toys. So we now have the ability, we now have the, 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 the tools to do this correctly. We, have the, uh, we can shrink the uh, synapses just about the same proportion uh, area-wise uh, as, 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 as in the brain. So I believe that, that the, the time is right for uh, companies to start developing uh, prototypes and, and probably there is, uh, uh, but I'm not aware of since I don't have much industrial contact. So, on, another question back here. Yeah, we move from the uh, commission. So this is for Steve and uh, for Stan. So, uh, all Stan. So, uh, so following uh, Professor Tuar's statement, all RM are memories progressive. So there are two types of RM, so unipolar and bipolar. So unipolar, you can add a uh, diode there to create this so-called 1D wire structure to, to solve the crosstalk problem in the last memory array. So all the memories that we discussed today are so-called bipolar devices. So how can we solve this crosstalk problem in large arrays if we are doing a first question that can we add a diode there, um, which will be difficult because we need a negative voltage to erase the device. So if we can't add a diode there, Okay, so if, if I may repeat the question, the question is, is, is really re, uh, directed primarily at crossbar memories, and the statement is that currently in these resistive crossbar memories, people talk about two different types. There's the unipolar type, in which uh, the uh, polarity of the voltage is not important in the switching. It's only the uh, current magnitude uh, uh, that, that's important in, in being able to switch such devices on and off. And then there's the bipolar devices in which the, uh, the, the switching either into its on or off state that depends upon the polarity of the applied voltage. Now, uh, the, the, the issue is that in a crossbar of, of such devices, if you try to uh, influence one device in a crossbar, you also have currents flowing through the entire crossbar, and you can get what are called sneak paths that, that uh, can 
uh, either inadvertently switch or, or disguise the reading of a, of a particular bit. And the way in which that, that problem has been handled in the past is to put explicit diodes, integrate them into the bits uh, of, of, of the crossbar. And so the question is, uh, with respect to these types of, of, of memristor switches, whether they're unipolar or bipolar, uh, do we see a means for uh, building such systems without having to have uh, explicit diodes in the device? So it's a very long statement, but it, do, did, did I get it uh, correct? Yes. Okay, so Steve, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I, seriously, I don't, I'm not an expert in that. All I know is that this is one of those issues that keeps getting raised, and it all depends on the very particulars of each of, of, of the device you're making, on, on how much, uh, um, uh, how precise you have to be in, in both the control and on the leakage path. Uh, so it was raised in both in the ITRS discussions and in, in our forum as a real issue. Um, I, so it, it is an issue. I don't know if the cost of putting a dial on each one is going to be less expensive than uh, a much more fancy uh, access circuitry that's more discriminatory. So that's th that's the trade-off. I don't know which way it will go. I was going to concede the stand. So, <laughs> so I, I mean, I, I have actually sort of uh, multi-level uh, answers to this. Uh, one is that uh, uh, you can, it is possible to design clever circuitry such that uh, it is not necessary to have diodes in the system. That's been done, and it was done with, with magnetic random access memory, which is a much, has a much smaller ratio of on to off than, than any of these switches. Uh, but of course, you know, the, the end result is a fairly expensive uh, set of circuitry and a, and a, and a slow process uh, 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 that, that you require. But, but uh, you know, there, there's, so there's a trade-off. The, the, the next level is that, that, that one of the reasons why we are very interested in having very, very nonlinear devices is that you can use those nonlinearities to block current flow uh, in appropriate ways. And so one thing I pointed out for our devices is that we've got this Schottky barrier, which has a factor of 10 or more rectification. And uh, it turns out that that is, 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 a, is more than enough to provide... Uh, the ability to both read and write blocks of, of memristors, which are not huge, uh, but, uh, but decent in size. And by decent in size, I'll say, you know, 100 by 100 blocks. So this is not 1,000 by 1,000 and certainly not a, a 10,000 by 10,000, but, but a 100 by 100 block is, is something that can be handled with relatively straightforward circuitry using extreme nonlinearities in the devices themselves. And so then that comes to the third point, and that is, is it realistic to build a system in which you have simply 100 by 100 blocks? And the answer to that is absolutely. And in fact, that's Dmitry Strukov's invention, uh, although it's very difficult to describe in anything less than three hours. Uh, I'll, I'll recommend to you a paper that uh, Dmitry and I published in, in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences in December and that's this whole concept of the four-dimensional address space, because with this CMOS interface that Dimitri invented, it is possible to use a very small amount of CMOS to address a huge amount of memory and never have a block larger than effectively 100 by 100 elements. In fact, many of the blocks can be much smaller than that. So it's a little, it's, 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 it's a bit difficult to just describe without having a blackboard and being able to literally spend a lot of time drawing out the architecture. But, but in fact, uh, for memories, I think that Dimitri's invention of the four-dimensional address space is at least as important, if not even more important, than the memristors themselves. And I think that that architecture will be the, 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 the real killer in terms of being able to make uh, commercial memories because uh, uh, it will allow you to address huge amounts of memory, and your effective block size is, is, is very small, well within the realm that simple circuitry can handle uh, the, uh, uh, the, the sneak paths with, with uh, the amount of nonlinearity that we have in the devices. So 
I, I, I commend you to, to the, 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 the paper in, in PNAS. I have uh, one more question for Dr. Stan Williams and Yabiyam. Uh, do you think, uh, is it possible to build a new device through the terminal, uh, may I receive a three terminal device? Three terminal. Are you asking, you're asking me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, you, 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 you can define it, uh, it's, it's, it's the obvious one, you just make it vectors, okay? so. And, and the, 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 the uh, question is, uh, what do you, why do you want three terminals? Uh, is, if, if the interest is to make it smaller and smaller, and, and uh, I, you would want to avoid the third terminals, uh, because that will always create a lot of routing problems and others, okay? Uh, but in, in terms of whether you can define one, yes, of course, it, you can, if it's, it's just make it a vector, it will be defined in exactly the same way. So uh, I also take a crack at this. It turns out that uh, in 1959, Bernie Woodrow mm -hmm. at Stanford University built a device that he called a memister, mm -hmm. not with no R, memister, and that device is a three-terminal device with memory. All right, and he used it in a machine. That uh, that was built for 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 essentially memory, uh, a a a synaptic-like computation that he called Adelaide, and that machine still sits on his desk today in his <laughs> office at Stanford. Uh -huh. And the memisters that he <coughs> built, which were actually discrete devices uh, made with liquid cells and and all sorts of stuff, still exist and still work. So memisters are, are, are interesting. They're, they're especially interesting with respect to uh, some ways of designing neural circuitry. Uh, uh, and so there, there have been a few people that have looked at these over the years. And in fact, in, in, in our laboratory, we have fabricated memisters as well as memristers. And we've made memisters where the total size of the memister is only maybe 20 nanometers on a side. So we have very, very small three-terminal memisters, and the, the circuit diagram for the memister is just essentially two memristers in <coughs> parallel. So that gives you the three terminals. And you can, you can think of, of these devices as having uh, a, a, uh, uh, an induced <coughs> memristance where you're, where you're actually able to put a, a bias voltage on one memristor and you get the third terminal changing. And so there's, 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 you know, as, as, as Leon said, it becomes a vectorial type of, of, of system. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting, kind of complicated. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we're, we're going to be submitting a paper on this uh, very soon. So it's, uh, uh, you know, we've built them, we've tested them, they're kind of cool. Uh, as to whether, and at the end of the day, they have any real advantages over just a two-terminal memristor, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, the, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of nice, but, but, but anyone who's, who's, who's wrestled with circuit layouts will, will, will recognize that it's much easier to pack two terminal devices into a small area than three terminal devices. That, that pesky third wire just always gets in the way. Yeah. Well, there, there is one advantage. If, uh, if you have three terminals, there is a possibility to uh, make it locally active, which means you can actually make an amplifier out of that. So, so in two terminals, it, you, you, it's impossible. You know, I proved that. You know, but and also you cannot, unlike a tunnel die, you can have a negative slope so you can make it amplify. It's impossible for, for a memory store two terminal. But for three terminal, that's possible. So that if there's a natural uh, 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 material where uh, you have this property, then that would, be, that would be a very important advantage. Yeah, the two terminal negative differential resistance devices that uh, you have worked with also, yeah. which were uh, you can always uh, <coughs> put two of them in series, and then you can make different Boolean logic circuitry, but then the operation principle will depend on the pulsed supply voltage. And it becomes very critical in terms of the shape of the pulse and the duration, because uh, depending on that, your switch functionality changes from one logic to another logic. And that's the main reason why the tunnel diode type of circuitry 
did not go anywhere, even though it was the precursor to <coughs> MOSFET devices, actually, because of the fact that the controllability on the circuit functionality was very difficult, actually. This is a question over here. Okay, so the, the question essentially deals with comparing uh, memristors with uh, flash memory devices. I mean, people have already made uh, flash memory devices uh, where you've got uh, stacked bits on, uh, on top of each other. And, you know, the other issue is that, that flash memory devices uh, are available now which have multiple bits per cell. And so that's, those are, those are interesting <coughs> ways of, of uh, increasing the bit density uh, uh, using this flash technology. And so uh, the question essentially is, uh, you know, what advantages, if any, do, do memristors have over that? And I'll, I'll ask for Steve to... Uh, Actually, um, again, uh, uh, I, you know, it's in, uh, in all these questions we have on, especially with multiple bits, where you have a very uh, tiny voltage margins to, to monitor, it's always a trade-off between the device characteristics and, and how complicated you have to make the, the access circuitry. So I don't know if the memristor has an, exam, has an advantage there, but that's the challenge in, in, in multiple bit flash. It's really um, you know, how, how well you can discern the, the individual states within the, within the single bit. So it would seem with the nonlinear um, uh, uh, response of, of the memristor that Theoretically, there's an advantage there, uh, but I, um, that's, that's as far as I thought about it. Maybe, uh, yeah, Pinocchio might have. Yeah, in Sonos, uh, <coughs> which is the Sony and uh, MNOS, uh, other mm -hmm. people call, they can store two bits. Uh, they use the two end, actually. So that's how they are <coughs> increasing the density by a factor of two. But uh, in the case of uh, <coughs> Memristor, I think we has uh, done some calculations and he thinks that what up to four bit you can store per cell. Great, that's true. But uh, I think I think I, I would agree. Stack is more efficient. Yeah, stack is of course very straightforward. But within the single cell, how device, many bits you can create? For our devices, we can we can store three bits. Three bits. But, uh, but then, as Steve said, then you have the reliability issues. Yes. Okay. Yes. <coughs> well, in DRAM, I think <coughs> I'm more familiar with DRAM because I have worked and wrote book in that area. I mean, there are manufacturers, they have uh, made, uh, you know, multiple uh, levels, but you need very accurate sense amplifier. Or, uh, I yeah. mean, this is very, I mean, to control the noise margin and the bit uh, density, that's the main problem, actually. Well, the flash is still, it's a three terminal device. You have that added. Um, uh, degree of freedom, which uh, you know allows you, I think, better access to to the state of the bit. I think with the memristor, without the three terminal, it seems like that would be a fundamental disadvantage. But again, I well, I, I think that 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 you that you uh, uh, I, I think that the that that there's two real major advantages of mem memristors right off the bat over flash, and and that is speed and power uh, of operation. I mean, the, the energy required to, to, to change a bit in a memristor is orders of magnitude smaller than for a flash memory. Mm -hmm. and, you can, and you can change the state orders of magnitude <coughs> faster. So, so speed and power, or energy and speed, whatever, are, are much uh, lower for memristors than, than, than for flash memory elements. There's also serious concern about the ability of flash to scale much smaller than it is now. Uh, so, I mean, several manufacturers have already said that the way they're going to scale going forward is to put more bits per cell. Mm -hmm. But then that, that really slows things down even further because then you've got to put an A to D converter in your system. You've got all the circuitry that you need 
in order to clean everything up and, 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 and make sure that the, uh, uh, that the system that, that, that's coming out is, is good. So, so there's, there's the you know, <coughs> speed and power issues, there's scalability, and then at the end of the day, there's still problems with endurance with, with uh, flash memory. And that, and that problem is even worse for the multi-bit uh, storage systems. Now, it's true that, that, the, that the memristors that of, of today aren't doing dramatically better than flash, but I think that that's more an issue of, of the fact that they're lab manufactured rather than fab manufactured. If, if we were to try to make a, uh, uh, you know, if, if in my lab we were attempting to make a, a flash memory today, it probably wouldn't work at all. Uh, the fact that we can make our, our memristors work as well as they do, given the conditions under which we make them, I think uh, is actually a very promising uh, uh, issue. So, so uh, I, I think that the real comparison will be when, when there are really high quality fab made memristors that are available for testing. Uh, that's, that's really what, what a lot of us are going to be looking for. So uh, uh, I, I think that the memristors have a lot of advantages over current flash. And, and they have to. And if, if we're going to be serious about competing with that established uh, uh, market uh, uh, going forward with the new technology, we're going to have to beat them effectively on every possible uh, 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 axis uh, in order, to, uh, uh, in, in, in order to, uh, to take out an existing technology. But to what extent, uh, you know, you have the inside information from Samsung or Micron Technologies Quite a few others, you know, they have been trying out with this memristor type of materials without knowing it is a memristor. As in RDAM, they tried, right? So, to what are the industrial data? Do you have any access to? Well, that? I, I, I mean, the problem is that I'm privileged to some information that's under okay. NDA and things like that. Okay, and so, okay. Okay. Uh, I'm not, uh, I, I'm, I'm not someone who should be attempting to speculate okay. on that right. because Sorry. It, it's, it's possible that I might stray over. An, an agreement. So I, I, I don't. I don't talk about other people's okay. uh, uh, other other people's devices. But I'll, I'll comment a little bit. Like for example, at the IEDM this year, mm -hmm. there was a big release of resistive RAM, mm -hmm. and so it's a different type. It's not ionic transport memristor. There is phase change memory. Mm -hmm. But you know, Intel is working with second companies <coughs> on the resistive change memory. And you know they're publicizing the large scale and density they can get. I know IBM is also working internally a great deal on the phase <coughs> change materials. And to them, it's a materials issue. The phase change materials have demonstrated to be more stable today <laughs> than the ionic materials. But I think all of them feel that they they have to go to a different system. That you know flash of today is not going to go much further. But phase change requires some temperature to switch from crystalline to amorphous state, right? That is correct. So that is associated with power consumption and all those things, right? Right. There's other issues, but, you know, they want a rock that they, you know, uh -huh. that they can switch, you know, 10 to the 6 times. Okay. Yes, there's a question in the back here. Yes. Uh, my name is Jesse Angle. So, uh, does anyone up here want to handle that, uh, Leon? What's the question? <laughs> okay, so, actually, that's right. I, I need to. I need to. to I, I need to rephrase the question. No so the question has yep. to do with, uh, given the, the the research now and expanding uh, the memristor concept into other memory devices, such as the uh, memory capacitor and memory inductor. If you had a a fab quality memory capacitor today, what would you do with it? Well, I think you, you can do a lot more, but uh, uh, it has the immediate advantage that it's, it's lossless. So I already memory store, you know, is, is, is superior in terms of, of uh, uh, energy loss, but it lost, it, it, it's dissipated. 
So, so the, the, the one advantage, if, if you can do the same thing, everything else, you would, you know, with the same cost, the capacitor would have the advantage that it's lossless, at least conceptually. Okay. And, but I think there, there, there would be many more uh, advantages by virtue of the fact that it's, it's a dynamic. Uh, of course, the memory resource are dynamic, but capacitor has a, in, in, in a sort of intuitive way, a, a much more flexible type of dynamics that uh, I, uh, I, 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 I would tend to believe that there, there, there will be many more fascinating things you can do that is not yet uh, 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 found. So, so uh, and, and, and uh, just by virtue of the fact that you, you have a higher order uh, uh, dynamics involved. So I mean, I'll just sort of chip in a little bit. Uh, I mean, this, this issue of power dissipation is important. And if you can make a really good MEM capacitor that doesn't have parasitic resistance as part of it, you can do a lot of the synaptic types of things that people have been talking about using a capacitive element <coughs> rather than a resistive element. <coughs> and so that's uh, an, an interesting possibility for, for even lower power analog computing. Uh, uh, something that uh, someone in my research group is looking at, a guy named Greg <coughs> Snyder, has been looking at uh, mm. uh, synaptic computing using uh, mem resistors and uh, mem capacitors as well. So there's interesting, interesting possibilities there. I mean, the, the mem resistor itself could decrease the amount of, of energy required for a, an analog computation by a very large number of orders of magnitude. I won't even say a number because any time I say it, people guffaw. But, uh, you know, and, and we're not even close to being there yet, but the mem capacitors have an even larger potential there. So uh, uh, I, I think that there are some really uh, uh, interesting uses there. But, but any, any uh, implementation of a mem capacitor that I've seen, including the one that we've done, uh, in collaboration with UCLA, does have a significant uh, 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 parasitic resistance as a part of it. It's so, so it's not total. So it, so it actually is dissipated. Can I ask uh, Leo a question? Um, I think since uh, 2008, uh, interest has gone up worldwide. And I know, Leo, you've been invited to give a talk, so, so can you share, you know, where you have given talk and what type of responses you have gotten all over the world? So, so, let, so let me re repeat that question for the for the uh, mm -hmm. recording. So, the, so uh, uh, Steve Kang asked uh, Leon a question about uh, since 2008, uh, when uh, memristors became uh, a bit more, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, visible to people. Uh, he's been uh, traveling the world and has given a, a lot of talks. And so what Steve would like to know is, you know, uh, roughly how many talks and, and how uh, are, are people receiving uh, this uh, concept of the memristor when, when, when uh, Leon gives a talk? Uh, well, uh, understandably, a lot, a lot of, I have received a lot of invitations and I didn't have enough time to, of course, accept all of them. But for those that I have uh, traveled to, and most of these were in Europe, uh, 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 probably because they, they pay my way, okay? <laughs> and and uh, uh, the, my universe, I mean, my uh, impression is that they, everybody is excited about it. They want to know uh, when, when, when is SP going to have this uh, commercial, commercialized, as it was asked. So, so, so there's no question that it, it has fascinated uh, a lot of people and, 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 and a lot of a, a, a immense interest of, of uh, people realize there's a lot of potential, okay? Uh, but also, uh, uh, I, mean, I want to take this opportunity to point out that until uh, we educate a new generation of uh, future engineers and researchers that, that know how to handle uh, nonlinear problems, because my research, by definition, had to be nonlinear, and and which means that that the, the current uh, graduates are really unprepared, and and not only unprepared, they are intimidated. They tend to shy away, you know, and uh, from that. So so I believe that that uh, and perhaps I should throw that with Steve. Uh, 
uh, as Helen, because you actually possibly could play a role by, uh, I would think that the, the least that, that SRC perhaps could do is to offer some, some uh, scholarships to, 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 to uh, PhD for a few major universities that, so that they could start uh, being trained. We do need, and especially we also need to offer classes uh, uh, to, to teach the, you know, not just memory research, but, but uh, as uh, Stan has mentioned, as we go to a uh, nano scale, it's going to be highly nonlinear. You've got to uh, be equipped to handle nonlinear problem uh, and, and not be intimidated by it. Uh, that's only, the only way you can make major progress, in my opinion. And we, we, we need to have some leadership that, that would uh, start offering courses uh, in, in the general nonlinear analysis aspects uh, and with Mamdishno as perhaps a focal point. I, I can comment on that. Uh, yeah. the, the beauty of SRC is we respond to the industry needs in a very, um, uh, a very effective way and very quickly. Um, and just in the last few years, our whole focus has shifted from from digital to analog, for instance, because most of the membership is, is, uh, is uh, some of the, uh, the application space is getting more important to train analog designers. So it's a step in the right direction. Um, I think as, as, as companies start to see these other nonlinear issues and even, you know, as memristors start to become important, uh, you'll see a lot of research pop up very quickly because it will be mm -hmm. it's just the way the industry works. Yeah. <coughs> Well, Leon has <coughs> brought up a very important issue. I mean, I was in NSF, and uh, one of the <coughs> problems is for the <coughs> younger researcher is that they are between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> in one side, Stan Williams sitting with 40 PhD doctoral, I mean, those who have already <coughs> done doctoral research, they are very advanced researcher, and they have taken care of all the practical problems. And in the other side, Leon, who has the brain of 40 top theorists, and he has solved all the theoretical things, actually. So what can a young professor with one graduate student or something like that can do in this field, which can really make significant difference? And when they write a grant application, this becomes a real issue that, OK, I mean, <clears throat> many of these things look interesting, but to what extent it will make a huge, you know, intellectual uh, contributions, that becomes an issue. And the second issue is that since it is decoupled from the existing uh, sets of courses in VLSI or circuit theory or architecture, this is a new paradigm how, I mean, uh, we are going to, <coughs> it's like a chicken and egg syndrome, right? I mean, unless you educate these uh, younger guys, they cannot be motivated, they cannot visualize these uh, complexity issues uh, in nonlinear dynamics or <coughs> STDP-based circuit design. And on the other side, you know, I mean, what can a young professor with one or two graduate students do, actually? And this is really, really problem in the face of the highly competitive grant situation that most of the NSF uh, <coughs> PIs uh, face. So uh, how we are going to address that, actually? How we are going to educate the people so that they can uh, do research at an advanced stage? And I try to internally argue, and that's the reason I got funded this uh, uh, workshop twice, because just with one-time funding, I thought that it is not enough to create materials, which Professor <coughs> Kang had done so beautifully, keeping everything available to the uh, research community. But uh, this, you know, this is a very complex uh, intertwined problems. I think that's what I would like to see that, you know, what as a community you have to say and to what extent we can try to still leverage funding from NSF and all other places so that we can advance this frontier beyond, I mean, more than where, where we are right now, actually. Well, if, if I might comment on that, uh, I mean, Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm privileged to have a, a very strong research group of people uh, working away on this. And, and yes, I mean, we're all in awe of, of, of Leon. Uh, but 
I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, every time I see a paper coming out from Yuri and, and Max uh, Deventra, I'm going, damn, I wish I'd thought of that. Damn, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> I mean, these guys are pumping papers out like every other month, and every time I see one, ah, oh, you know. Uh, so there is a huge amount of room for creativity in this, in this field. And there, there is, I mean, I mean, we have just, you know, it's, it's not even the, the tip of an iceberg. I mean, we're, we're looking at the first few tiny little snowflakes on the top of the iceberg. There is so much there uh, that, that as you start digging into it, you, you, you realize more and more how, how much we don't understand and how much, uh, uh, how, how, how much there is to do. If you just sort of look at the amount of research, think about the, the it's got to be millions of researcher years of effort went into silicon sure. to, to get us to the point to where we got, uh, you know, to, to where we are now. Well, frankly, it's going to take a, an effort as large if we're ever going to have a, essentially a, 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 a memorist or industry. There is so much out there to, to, to figure out. Uh, I mean, you know, in, in my group, I sort of feel like we're at about the eighth layer of, of, of discovery now. Uh, but I think that there's an infinite number of layers above us. And, you know, we may be a few layers ahead of other people, but uh, 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 I, I, I see plenty of opportunity for, for single professors with one graduate student to, to come up with things that's going to, you know, have me slap in my head again because, uh, uh, you know, we can't uh, possibly do everything ourselves. It's, this, is going to, this is going to require a very large concentrated effort to move this forward. And, you know, people are just going to have to see, I mean, some of us are just going to have to make some progress or make enough progress to convince everybody else and moreover to convince people in the funding agencies that this is indeed a place where they want to be, uh, uh, be funding more efforts. Can you also ask uh, Cameron and Shravya maybe to add your own uh, comments in uh, education aspect? You, you've been a world-class professor, so... Well, I don't know about that, but I was going to raise the same question with Stan. The success of really most technology in the early days was there was somewhere some designers and a fabrication were coupled together through uh, MP-type programs, multi-project ship programs. And that was one single issue that allowed people to be creative. As soon as we learned a little bit, there was something else that built up. And uh, whether, in fact, you see in the horizon, uh, not too far ahead, that such a process can be made available. Maybe some of the funding agencies, uh, not just United States, but globally come together to provide that uh, input to allow uh, these young researchers uh, to build up that kind of things because as I said uh, unless there are a, a coherent way of bringing a larger number of educationists uh, and students together it's going to take a much longer time for industry to benefit from this mm -hmm. but if the larger people for example you have already mentioned in two years we were doing some council number of papers it has it is almost exponential growth. Everybody in the very small cells are talking about membristers and membristive systems. So if, for example, this fabrication process can be solved because we can go to the larger companies. They got their own in-house. But if, uh, and we have tried, uh, we are just trying to control the oxygen. We showed you some numbers. Uh, now it's going to take us a little bit longer to kind of to do that. But if there are advances there, and some of that material, even though there are some confidential base for that, but if it can move forward, then I think it can create a whole different paradigm of design. And maybe some of the problems that these guys have, and they show that as uh, uh, part of the roadmap, it can be solved sooner rather than later. Okay, I think we have a you know, uh, really extensive discussion. So. I'd like to thank uh, all the panelists and uh, all the attendees of this uh, wonderful discussion throughout the day. And we have come uh, to the end of uh, today's uh, session. I'd like to also uh, remind you that uh, tomorrow, uh, which is uh, February 3rd, in the afternoon, there are many, many outstanding uh, post papers. So, so that will be at the Sherrock Hotel on uh, Sherrock Avenue and uh, Erston. Uh, in Berkeley downtown. So if you have time, please go and then attend the poster session. And that is free of charge uh, for attendees of this symposium. So 
Uh, with that, I'd like to give, give a big applause to everybody in this room. So thank you very much. I have six of top models, uh, you, uh, and then on Wednesday you will... Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm staying. Yes, I'm staying. Yes, I'm staying.